Major funding for In Your Neighborhood Long Branch has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. And PSENG, we make things work for communities. From sun-soaked sand to Liberty State Park, High stakes gaming to dizzying heights. With drive-ins, dinos, and disco fries, tourism's on tap in the Garden State. We're in your neighborhood, Long Branch, exploring it all. Major funding for- I'm I'm Mary Alice Williams. We're in your neighborhood, Long Branch, spending a day at the beach to spotlight the economic engine that is New Jersey tourism. It had a record $45.4 billion impact on the state's economy last year. The State Division of Travel and Tourism says the industry supports nearly 523,300 jobs. That's 9.8% of all jobs in New Jersey. And it generated $10.5 billion in government revenues last year. In all, Tourism represents 6.7% of the entire state economy. It's hundreds of diners make it the diner capital of the world with fare that sticks to your ribs and has more shopping malls packed into 25 square miles than any place in the world to make a dent in your wallet. But the state has unique summer attractions that actually stick to your soul. David Cruz went down the shore. Growing up in the city, the Jersey Shore was almost an exotic place for me. I didn't make my first visit here until I was 14 years old. Of course, today we crisscrossed the state pretty much every day, and I visited most of these Jersey Shore towns. Rarely as a tourist, though, until now. Welcome to LBI! LBI, Long Beach Island, is made up of six towns. Our first stop here is Beach Haven. This guy is Jeff Santalosi with LBI Surfing. At four locations on the island, Jeff and his team teach surfing to kids of all ages. And uh, so a typical day is we have anywhere from 10 to 60 kids that we uh, set up with camps or lessons. And uh, yeah, we, we progress them on to the next stage of their surfing. After which you can hit the links at Bill Burr's classic Flamingo Golf on 5th and Long Beach Boulevard. For 58 years now, the place to hit the mini links. Kirk Van Curren started here as a part-timer in 1977 and bought the place in 2000. This is an institution that really is part of the fabric of this community. It's fun to see them come back and the fact that they do enjoy it and a lot will recognize. You were here when I was, you know, growing up. Right. And I'm like, yes, I was. I remember you. Fun facts, the lighthouse here was modeled after old Barney in Barnegat Light. And Kirk, who teaches high school math during the off-season, designed and built the windmill himself back in the 90s. And that's lunch. And lunch has to be Neptune Market, since 1946 up the boulevard in Harvey Cedars. Albert Hall and his wife, Terry, have owned it since 2006. This feels very much like... Uh, a place where, you know, to use an old line, everybody knows your name. Exactly right. We have a sign, well, we used to have it up there, and it said, enter as strangers, leave as friends, and we live by that credo. Friendly staff, delicious food, including couscous and filet mignon, and atmosphere for days. If you're staying in Harvey Cedars, why would you eat anywhere else? Watch the tram car, please. If you're on the boardwalk, you're near one of Maury's piers. There are three of them, and they've been defining fun here since 1969. Family owned for three generations. Wildwood is very family oriented. It's you see generations of family come year after year. Um, you see people, you know, coming down, having va family vacations here, having second homes here. Um, so it's really a wonderful thing. Number ten of the winner. Wow, this guy's a Okay already, lady. I'm just trying to get a slice. Where? Well, that's Sam's on the boardwalk, of course. Anthony Zuccarello is Sam's son-in-law. Sam started in 1957, and he just left a little while ago. He's 89 years old. He comes every day, has three slices, and just been running the operation ever since Tony's Sam's son, and that's his son over there. And uh, I'm the son-in-law, and that's uh, my son working here. So 
we have generations working here also. This is a little hot, so I'm gonna just let it sit for a minute. All right, that's long enough. No, actually, this is really hot. Maron. That's good stuff. The best way to enjoy Sam's and Maury's and just about everything down the shore, experts say, is book early. Stay away from the hotel chains and come down on weekdays when the rates are cheaper and the lines are way shorter. So we'll end here in Asbury where my shore story began. Things in this town are changing a lot. But one thing about the shore is you're never too far from running into someone you know. Lance. Good to see you. Good to you see been? you. Good to Debbie. see you. Happy summer. Another summer, Another summer down the shore. It's a lot more than the shore. In fact, Secretary of State Tahisha Way says non-shore counties generated 52% of tourism revenues last year. Economic forecasts for tourism rely on the forecast. Well, today's a perfect day to get outside and play. Brianna Vernozzi did. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, it's warm, it the water. Warm. We may be the fourth smallest state in the country, but we pack millions of open air acres all ready for you to roam. New Jersey's natural treasure, the hundreds of state, national, and county parks. Our adventure begins in South Jersey at Wharton State Forest in the heart of the Pinelands. At roughly 120,000 acres in size, it's the largest tract of land in the New Jersey State Park System. In the forest itself, we have about 145 miles of trails, but here at the recreation area, we have two trails, uh, about three miles total. Um, but nearby, we also have the Batona Trail and the Yellow Trail, which is the Mullica River Trail. The forest stretches between parts of Burlington, Camden, and Atlantic counties. And yes, there are hikes long enough to take you through each. You can literally go out here for weeks on, an end, on end and, and see something new every day. There's also campgrounds, fishing, and boating of all kinds. At the AtSign Recreation Area, you can take a swim or soak in rays on the beach. The Nature Center shows off some of the endangered species and offers classes for students. And if the whole outdoors thing isn't for you, historic Batstow Village might just be your thing, a former bog iron and glass manufacturing site. You get the exercise you're walking through, but then you're also learning. You're getting a history lesson at the same time. One of the really neat features is that <laughs> you don't have very good cell service in the Pine Barrens, so you've <laughs> stepped back truly into the 19th century. Some 60 miles away in the Barnegat Bay, we're cruising along Island Beach State Park, a popular destination for beachgoers and summer tourists. It's one of the few remaining barrier islands actually along the whole east coast. Um, it's a 10 mile stretch of island surrounded by the Barnegat Bay, which you can see right here, and the Atlantic Ocean on that side. So it's a really special environment. These barrier islands don't really exist like this anymore. There's great fishing and clamming. This area is actually part of the Sedge Islands Marine Conservation Zone. It's one of the first protected conservation zones in the whole state. There's year-long programs for all ages to keep you coming back. I mean, there's so many health benefits to just getting some fresh air outside. Absolutely. And you can, you can see it. I always sleep better when I'm out here and being active. Yeah. Um, we have a number of trails, trails that go out to the ocean, trails that go out to the bay, that go through maritime forests that you don't get to see everywhere, and even just driving in the park. But you don't have to travel to remote corners to find a sanctuary. In one of the most populous cities in all of New Jersey, Liberty State Park, drawing roughly 4.5 million visitors a year. Why is having a park in an urban setting so important? What does it do for the residents here? It all comes down to quality of life and health. Having more open space and park space in very urban areas just has a better, healthier population. It was open to the public on Flag Day, which is June 14th, 1976. At the time, this was a massive railroad yard, an old industrial site um, that had been dilapidated for years. 
and it was the goal of some local residents and preservationists to actually build a park right behind the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. Even though the once thriving rail industry no longer runs here, remnants of the old Central Railroad of New Jersey terminal take up the northern portion of the park. This was a hub for immigrants as well, yeah? You had a lot of folks coming to and from New York City to go to work every day, but you also had immigrants that were processed off Ellis Island. They would come here and this is where they would start their journey west. And every year, hundreds of thousands flock here to hop a ferry for a tour of Ellis Island and Lady Liberty. The skies are just starting to open up. We're getting a few raindrops, but you can see that's not stopping visitors from getting on this ferry. It's already packed. I'm going to hop on and we're going to have a look at Ellis Island. Until Liberty State Park was built, there was only one way to get there, from Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. In addition to visiting the historic museum, the park is host to the Liberty Science Center, and most of the nearly 1,200 acres is open space. For residents who live in Jersey City who may not have a backyard, myself included, this is kind of their backyard. I like to call it the front yard, right? So this is Jersey City's front yard to the world. And some front yard it is. So no matter where you are in the state, go explore. There's one waiting just for you. With two new casinos and legalized sports betting, Atlantic City is riding a hot streak. There are places also where grown-ups attracted to glitz can get their share of thrills. Places where families can find storybook days with fairy tale endings. There are buildings where our forebears embedded right in the walls the roots of the state's revolutionary history. Lauren Wonko, Leah Mishkin, and Brenda Flanagan tried to see them all. You're just gonna chop the edge off. Watch your fingers. <laughs> we traveled back in time to the turn of the 20th century and learned how to carve decoys. There you go. In Tuckerton, hungry locals often hunted waterfowl. Before they boarded their boats, though, some would visit a decoy carver shop, similar to this one at the Tuckerton Seaport and Bayman's Museum. Why were decoys important at Tuckerton? Well, if you wanted to get the birds, and they wanted to get the birds, both to eat and to and sometimes sell, and they also took people out hunting, a uh, guide, acting as guides. They wanted to get the birds to come to them. The only way they're gonna do that is with the decoy. The charming waterfront buildings here, like the Clam House and Boat Works, are representations of historical places in and around Tuckerton. We want to give people a kind of a slice of life of what uh, life was like around the Barnegat Bay at the turn of the 20th century, and we want them to carry that information through and think about the differences between then and now. We're inside a replica of Tucker's Island Lighthouse. It now stands at the seaport. It was originally located nearby. It fell in the water in 1927 after a series of storms. There are 42 steps to the top. 42 just happens to be the exact number of steps here at the Seagirt Lighthouse. This is the original land-based building. It dates back to 1896. Unlike some of the other lighthouses at the time, this one had indoor plumbing, three bedrooms, a kitchen, and more, which is why it was considered a bit of a dream job for the keepers. Now visitors are invited to climb this lighthouse and the many others throughout the state. This is basically the midway point between Navasink Twin Lights to the north and then Barnegat to the south. And so what would happen was when mariners were leaving Twin Lights, they could not yet see Barney. So this lighthouse was erected to illuminate that dark space. This is the original ladder the keeper would climb. He'd carry coal with him to fuel the light, and he also had to come up to clean often. If the windows were dirty, the light wouldn't shine bright enough for those on the ocean. Years ago, lighthouse keepers weren't the only New Jerseyans to live where they worked. There are several historic villages in the state, offering people a sense of what it was like to work in New Jersey hundreds of years ago. The historic village at Allaire, located within Allaire State Park, was a prosperous iron producing community in the 1830s. Workers and their families lived here, and many of the original buildings still remain, like the bakery, general store, and blacksmith shop. Let's head inside and see what he's working on. What were they making in here? Well, a lot of tools for the, for the blast furnace, a lot of repair work. We may have to install tires on wagon wheels, a lot of horseshoeing. We made a chain link and a decorative heart. How am I doing? <laughs> I've seen worse. Clearly, blacksmith Kevin Marshall is the expert. He's given presentations to 7,000 school kids this year alone. These sites are open throughout the summer, 
giving visitors a chance to embrace New Jersey's history. New Jersey, a place where crowds pack dance floors and concert venues, a state known for boardwalks and casinos. It's stimulation overload, a pace in sync with the speed of the roulette table. Come on, big money. Paths guided by the glowing lights of the slot machines, all driven by the hypnotizing sounds of winning machines drawing you in. This is Atlantic City. When New Jersey first opened, they had the world by them because they had it all to themselves. Nobody else on the East Coast had a casino. The first casino outside of Nevada opened here back in 1978. In the 80s, it was all about, you know, the, all the clubs in the area, you know, like Joey's and Clifton was, you know, that was the big club in the day. You know, all these diners, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you'd walk in there at 2 in the morning, you'd be a wait. There'd be a wait. You had to wait to get a table. Some say TikTok diners where the disco fries originated. Lathered in gravy sauce, topped with fresh mozzarella cheese. It was the late night food of choice back in the 70s and early 80s after a night at the disco. And it's still a Jersey staple to this day. But at Rat's Hut, they say nightlife across the state has changed. It, there might be one night out of those four days that you're gonna get that kind of uh, action in, in the places late night. Other than that, it's, it's not worth the risk. What hasn't changed? is the Rutz Hut hot dog. Uh, two beers, two Coors Lights, and uh, a Coke. The chili is an added touch, but what separates this place from any other hot dog place, their homemade relish. They've been cooking them this way for 90 years. See how it's ripped? Yeah. That's why we call them rippers. You see it's deep fried, you see it's still bubbling, right? It's coming right. right out of the oil to you. So the way I would eat it is this way. And it's the way you're gonna eat it. This is the key. This is a family recipe? This is a secret recipe. Yes, it's all about that relish. So you have disco fries and deep fried hot dogs, but there's one food that divides this state in two. South Jersey insists it's pork roll, but here it's Taylor Ham. Legend has it Ernest Hemingway was a regular here. Sizzling noise of the Taylor Ham on the stove poetically placed next to the egg yolk bubbling nearby. At Summit Diner, which opened back in 1939, they top it off with some potatoes. I mean, we have little babies now that I was serving their grandparents. But while the food hasn't changed over time, casinos in Atlantic City were affected. The industry took a hit when other states started legalizing gambling, and five casinos have closed their doors since 2014. So how do you think Jersey can get back, in, get back to what it once was? They have to make the sports betting attractive without taking out that much from the bet you make. Many people see sports betting as a game changer. What we're seeing again in Atlantic City now, just this week, we're gonna have two new places opening, so people are going back to work. More people can stay overnight. More people have things that they can do here. Um, and that's good for Atlantic City, it's good for New Jersey, and uh, certainly good for Trap County. Inside these walls, you don't know if it's morning, afternoon, or night at this 24-hour place. Whenever that sun rises, one thing is for sure. New Jerseyans are keeping the traditions that make this place the Garden State. a summer playground and families in the know head down the shore to Ocean City and a beach with bumper to bumper baby buggies, plastic toys and sandy kids including half buried Harrison Hervatus here with his mom Gemma. It's like doesn't everyone know that Ocean City, New Jersey is the place to go for families? Ocean City's eight miles of sandy strand with lifeguards and a bustling boardwalk spells family. But the special sauce that draws families here there's no sauce. It's dry, no alcohol, so you know that nothing bad's gonna happen. You can feed the kids along a bustling boardwalk, entertain them on a ride at Wonderland, and take them to a spacious bathroom where even the men's room has a changing table. A daily beach badge is five bucks. Ask kids at this nursery rhyme theme park for pint-sized patrons, what's your favorite ride? Usually, it's bubbles. It goes up. And it goes, and it twists. 
I don't have to worry about the safety here and the kids. Um, it's characters that she recognizes from stories that she knows and it's really great. Storybook Land opened in 1955, hand built on five shady acres in Egg Harbor Township by a house painter from Vineland. He just wanted to create a family friendly place uh, for people on their way down to the shore to stop, stretch their legs, relax. And the kids is enjoying it so far and it's a nice park quiet, lots of shade. Families can bring their own snacks. Tickets purchased online cost $24.50 and kids under two are free. If somersaulting at dizzying speeds your special thing, Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson still got the coasters that'll make your hair stand on end, literally. But it was fun, you know, like the scary type of fun that gets you going like, woo, I wanna go, I wanna go again. And perfect for families with teens seeking thrills. The park rotates and updates its selections. This season it debuted a brand new seven story superhero ride called Cyborg Cyberspin. <laughs> pivoting and flipping. It's very chaotic and super fun. But the park's also got a ride for gaming hotshots. Riders on Justice League Battle for Metropolis each get a virtual laser gun for plugging bad guys on a trip featuring 3D graphics and a running score. It's interactive. They get to participate. So it's a lot of fun. You can score a ticket that includes the safari ride online for 55 bucks. And speaking of interactive, yeah, that's a giant blob of snot hanging from an animatronic faucet called Mr. Knows-It-All. A new exhibit appropriately called Grossology just opened at the Liberty Science Center. It's designed to teach kids all about those body functions that horrify adults to most kids' delight. Run for cover! <laughs> Probably the summer's biggest attraction is the Dino Dig. The center buries bones in a big sandbox and shows kids how paleontologists on a real dig use brushes to uncover fossils. They learn that the velociraptors from Jurassic Park were actually about the size of a German shepherd. When you see them in the movies, they're big and massive and really intimidating predators. But if you take a look at our fossil here, it's not all that big. Dino Dig runs through September 3rd, Grossology till almost Labor Day, when most families start planning to send their kids back to school. I'm Brenda Flanagan. Now we can't cover the wonders of New Jersey without mentioning the downright weird. From the devil's tree and abandoned asylums to psychedelic cottages and quirky roadside attractions, one magazine has been chronicling the state's bizarre offerings for the past 25 years. Michael Aaron is here with the publisher and co-founder of Weird New Jersey, Mark Moran. Michael? That's, that's right, uh, Mary Alice, and this is Weird New Jersey. I've seen it many times over the years. I haven't spent a whole lot of time with it. Mark Moran, what, tell us about Weird New Jersey. Uh, well, we like to think that the uh, title is self-explanatory. Uh, it's weird stuff here that can be found here in New Jersey, and that covers everything from um, abandoned places, um, haunted places, just odd roadside things, uh, architecture, signs, um, just about anything that's really just catches your eye and makes you curious. You've sustained this for 25 years. How have you managed to do that? This is the tw <laughs> 25th anniversary that, that, issue. Yeah, that's the 50th issue. We've put out two a year for the past 25 years. And uh, that's where New Jersey is just weird enough that we can <laughs> keep it going. Is there anything uniquely weird about New Jersey? Or is every place in the country as weird? Well, we, we, we did a, a series of books. We, do, we did about uh, 35 books on uh, other states. Um, and we always said that we could, we could put out a book on any state but there's only one place where we can make a magazine 50 issues worth of uh, material, and that's right here. You publish, you edit, you write. Uh, do you devote all your time to this? Well, it's just a two-man operation for the most part. Uh, we do get some help for, from some friends, but it's generally myself and my partner, Mark Skirman, uh, who have done this together, and we do all the work ourselves. So it is the only thing we really do because it, 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 there is a lot of work involved. Uh, the Jersey Devil... Does that feature in your writings and your... Yeah, he's uh, kind of the mascot of the magazine. We've used him in the logo for many years. He's on all of our T-shirts, and uh, he's, uh, you know, he's uniquely New Jersey. You can't find a Jersey devil in any other state or country. 
And, um, you know, for the, the, I mean, it's a great piece of folklore, but then there are people who believe it's, it's an actual, uh, you know, animal entity, too. And He's like the Sasquatch out yeah, west, right? Right, but, but even more bizarre because it can fly and it's got a, you know, a, a horny tail. And, uh, you know, it, if, if, if you, you can believe in it or not believe in it, but I, I dare anybody to spend a couple nights in the Pine Barrens alone and uh, then judge for themselves whether they believe it. You think you have another 25 years of this in you? <laughs> God willing, my friend. <laughs> uh, l what are your plans for Weird New Jersey in 30 seconds? Uh, well, we travel the state, and um, whatever is weird within the, the six months that we, you know, in between issues, whatever we can find, and we uh, rely heavily on our readers. So if anybody out there has a story to tell, please contact us through our website, weirdnj.com. We'd love to hear from people. Mark Moran, very interesting to hear what's behind this magazine. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Mary Alice, back to you. Thanks, Michael. This fall, we're headed to your neighborhood, Vineland, and we're looking at the reason that we're called the Garden State right at harvest time. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for joining us on this beautiful day at the beach, and thank you, Long Branch. Working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. And PSENG, we make things work for communities.